Good morning to all of you. Can I have my first slide, please? <clears throat> ah, there it is. Good. Well, first few words about myself. I've been in this business for longer than I really like to think of, for about 35 years. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read it. My slides will be available after this talk. Oh, it wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> right. So, ah, that is. Before I start my real talk, there are some beliefs, some credos, if you want, that I'd like to share with you. If you don't agree with them, you may not like the rest of my talk. The first one is, if the users can't use it, it doesn't work. So, it's as important that usability is okay as it is that the thing works. Number two, usability professionals must set a good example by making usable stuff. We should not just preach usability, we should also practice it. We should write usable usability test reports, we should make usable presentations, we should seek feedback from our users on everything that we are doing. In order to make usable stuff, we must understand our stakeholders, in particular our bosses, and their perception of us. And this is a suitable time for me to show you the first video, which I did not make myself. It's made by a Norwegian company, and it comes here. The text at the bottom is, do you know a designer? Because they made this because they want to hire people. Art director, creative leader, idea astronaut. The classification of UX designers is constantly evolving. This example might seem like a new and trendy breed, but this is in fact an old school UX designer. Notice how the wallpaper on his Macintosh says Comic Sans, but the artwork itself is not composed of that particular font. This is considered funny by his peers. This specimen has unfortunately fallen into a state commonly known as pixel paranoia. This is contemplating whether this button should be here, there, here, or there. This kind of aesthetic compulsory behavior that separates him from the UX architect. This peculiar being spends most of his time reading reports, which enables him to answer any question with a reference to a theoretical study. An unfortunate side effect of this obsession is the lack of certain other skill sets. designer is the usability test. This is where all the hard work can be rendered useless in a matter of seconds. One wrong move from the user and it's back to the drawing board. Disaster has struck. This designer will have to face a demoralizing process of coming up with a better solution. Devastating. If you spot a UX designer interacting with common human beings, it is likely you are witnessing a ritual known as a workshop. The workshop consists of a small separated pack, writing as much as possible on sticky pieces of paper. This is often followed by the pack decorating the walls of their current habitat with these vibrant colors. Why they display this sort of behavior, no one knows. These rituals often include awkwardly choreographed exercises assumed to enhance creativity amongst the tiny pack. The result is a quite extraordinary display of human behavior. Only time will tell how many viable ideas or maybe yet another creative job title will come out of this act.
Yes. All right. So what do I want to say with this? Well, it seems that there are some people who have interesting perceptions of us as UX designers and UX researchers. And we must be aware of that and take that into consideration. So here's my first question for you. What would you deliver if your boss asked you for a UX strategy plan? That's a perfectly fair question to ask a UX uh, person to see what is, what should our overall UX strategy be? Now, we don't have time to do a discussion about that in this forum, so I'm going to present two suggestions to you. First, a first a discount UX strategy plan, the status of the user experience as it stands, where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? That's the essence of a UX strategy. Um, it could also be a list of the KPIs you will use to measure the ROI of your UX activities and prove that you have reached the goal. And after I wrote that, I could not resist adding uh, of course, you all know what KPIs, KPIs and ROIs are. How many of you are not familiar with these expressions? Oh, good. So you all know this. Great. Just in case, I've added them on the next slide. The KPI is a key performance indicator and the ROI is the return on investment. We always preach that we should speak the language of our users. And I'm very glad to see that everyone here obviously understands the language of their bosses. Here's a slightly more extensive UX strategy plan, and that could essentially be the subject of another talk of mine. But the first one I think is particularly important. Create a sense of urgency. Show that there is a need for UX strategy and for UX as a whole. The second step is, of course, to tie the UX goals to the overall business goals. Produce short-term wins, show that usability really makes a UX work, really makes a difference. Pull together the guiding team, align UX with appropriate corporate priorities, Develop a three-year vision and make sure that it's communicated to your users. Communicate for understanding and buy-in. Empower others to act and be persistent. There's a lot more to be said about each of these steps, but this should give you an idea of what a UX strategy could look like. Before I start really answering some of the questions that tough bosses could have, to you, let me tell you a little bit about usability maturity. I think it was hinted at pretty briefly in the, in the introduction, but here's a little bit more. Usability maturity, that is the level of understanding and implementation of a systematic human-centered design process in an organization. And there are many scales of usability maturity I have brought with me today a small scale consisting of only four different uh, 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 levels, incomplete, performed, organized, and innovating, which is the best, the highest level of usability maturity, which few companies have actually reached. This is not quite true. This is what the official models say. There's an unofficial edition where we have one more level, Worst and worst, outright ridicule, hostility. Let me show you an example of that. In this, at this level, you could hear something like this. Cowboy programmers don't need no stinking usability. So why do we have these UX people in the first place? Or this one here from a Dilbert cartoon. Dilbert has done some usability tests and he gives it to his boss, and some rather bad results, 
and this is the boss's reaction. That is what I mean by very low or hostility towards usability work. So here are some of the characteristics of each of these steps. The incomplete step, everybody says, yes, I really want usability, but I don't have a budget for it. So usability is fine if it comes for free, but no one is willing to pay for it. At the next step, we have enthusiastic single persons, enthusiastic individuals who um, use ad hoc processes. They do a little bit of usability testing. They might even talk to some users and report their results back. The next step again, there are budgets available for UX work. The UX process is planned, monitored, and aligned. And the final step here in this simple uh, usability maturity model is UX is not dependent on any specific person. Cross-organization UX is natural part of development. That is, people talk together across the various departments about user experience. Oh, and I said that UX professionals try to make usable presentations. Well, one part of a useful presentation is audience involvement. So I'm sure you all brought your smartphone. Please bring out your smartphone now. Go to shakespeare.me and log in with Anna. And then vote for two choices here to answer the question, what can you do to boost usability maturity in an organization that is at level incomplete or performed. Please, it's totally anonymous. Neither your boss nor I will know what you answer to these questions. Thank you very much. Please keep your smartphones ready. There will be additional quiz questions later on in this talk. Let's take a look at the results. Yeah. So this is what I recommend. These are the green ones. They're the ones that I recommend. If you have a disagreement with that, come to me during the breaks. I'm going to be around for the rest of the day. So if you have any disagreements, please come and see me, and then I'll try to convince you that my views are right. I think that usability testing is one of the strongest tools we have available to boost the usability maturity. Heuristic inspections don't work because they are opinion-based, and the results 
will be rejected by the developers. Personas and scenarios are instruments that are not particularly convincing. I'm glad to say that, glad to see that very few people voted for this one. And again, usability tests of prototypes are some of the strongest instruments we have to prove to our colleagues, to prove to our bosses that UX work, work is really worth the effort. Right. So what can you do if you are at level performed or incomplete to boost usability maturity? Run usability tests, develop prototypes and run usability tests of prototypes, ask management and staff to use their own products and services like a customer. They may never have met a real customer in their life. So if you are at level managed, which I hope that some of you are, what can you do? You can market UX, you can measure UX and prove that there is progress. You can focus on user journeys instead of just UX. A great technique is to develop user journey maps in cooperation with your management. Write standards for UX work. UX work is no longer a piece of art. We have been in this business now for more than 40 years, and we gradually know what is right and what is wrong. So we should write that down in standards and follow it. Keep sharp. Insist on being measured. Ask mutual experts to assess the quality of your UX work. That is some of the, the advice that I can give you. Right. So, let me get back to the theme of my talk today. What to say to your boss when they ask tough questions. Number one. Oh, it's, it's the boss to the left and it's the UXer to the right. So what's the boss saying? Well, the boss could be saying, make this uh, thing black. Or the boss could be saying, I want the carousel on the home page. We have a name for these bosses and these kinds of opinions. Bosses like that are called hippos, the highest paid person's opinion. So perhaps some of you have a hippo in your habitat, in your surroundings. Well, I'm going to tell you in the rest of my talk a little bit about what you can do not to kill the hippo, because someone wants to ask me after this talk, Rolf, how do you kill the hippo? And I don't recommend that. But perhaps you can tame the hippo or convince the hippo uh, that there is another world, that there are other possibilities than opinions. So, I want the carousel on the home page. Let's just play around with that scenario for a little while and see how that could come up, how that could be in practice. Oh, that's not good. It's supposed to say something. I want a carousel on the home page. Oh no, this is not a good idea. I'm going to have to talk him out of this. Okay, why do you want that? Because it's the right thing to do. Right. Um, and how do you know that that's going to provide a better experience for our readers? Look, I've been working in this business for 34 years. I know my users. They'll love it. How long have you been working? Six months. How do you know that they'll love it? Most research says that many will consider it a nuisance. I'm sorry if I hurt your professional pride, but that's what we're doing. Yep. Anyone ever experienced anything like that? That is a particularly nasty hip hop that we have here. Now, let me show you, you can see scenario two with Sigurdi. So let's move on with this. 
I want to carousel the home page. Okay. Why do you want that? Because I know what our customers want. And I think I'm pretty good at having the right discipline to think through whether a lot of other people will want it too. Oops. Yep. Um, let me just mess around a little bit with this one here. This here. Yep. There it is. Here's what he just said. This is an actor. I asked him to say exactly that, and he did. Do you know who originally said that? I mean, because I know what our customers want and so on. Do you know who originally said that? No? Anyone dares? Very famous person in the UX world. And it's not Jacob Nielsen. No, it's Steve Jobs. It was actually Steve Jobs. And the problem with this is that Many bosses today think I'm as good as Jim Jobs. So, of course, we can do the same thing. And that's a tough sell to convince them that they're not Steve Jobs. Or that maybe not everything that Steve Jobs did was perfect. So, it's very important for us to realize that data is important, opinions are unimportant. Don't base your UX research on opinions unless you are at a very high level of usability maturity. So, UX based on data. So here's the next one. Let me just show it. I've got that in the video. I want to carousel on the home page. Okay. Well, what I'll do is I'll add this to our feature list. And all of the features we have on that list will be evaluated by real customers. So that way we can find out, for example, how important it is to them or how often they're likely to use it. We'll also attach the name of who proposed each feature to the feature list. So if we receive more than one request for the same feature, we'll combine those into a single feature request. And once we have the customer feedback, we'll evaluate them and prioritize them based on product team and customer feedback. We have a regularly scheduled meeting in which we do that, which I'm very happy to invite you to. So thank you for your suggestion. And now the hippo gets a little bit suspicious about what is going on. Um, so why are you adding names to the features? Well, firstly, the product team, when they start working on ideas, they might have some questions that they need to ask you about it. So it's good to know who to contact. And also, it's good to get the recognition that you deserve when you come up with a good idea. Yep. So there is something that you could do. Here it is again. No need to go through it again. Um, let me just switch to something slightly different. You will get back to the boss and, and his UX in just a moment. Here we have the frustrated usability tester, Paul. He's a usability engineer. He tells you about problems in his organization. Our management supports as well. We have a great usability lab, even in a separate building. Unfortunately, hardly anyone from the development ever shows up, even though their user interfaces are lousy. Our most recent test uncovered more than 90 problems we document everything. Our most recent report had 50 pages. Of course, we communicate the findings in the most modern ways. For this test, for example, I created a 15-minute video where I describe all problems and their causes in some detail. But of course, as so often before, nothing happened. I promised you a few more quiz questions. So, what are the causes of Paul's troubles? Vote for up to three choices. Please.
you can see that the votes are still pouring in. That's great. I'd like to move forward now. All right, let's see. Uh oh, uh oh. I don't think it's a good idea to tell the developers that they should attend usability test sessions. It should be made so easy for them to observe usability test sessions that they just can't resist it. You need to sell the product to them. So, conduct the usability test sessions at a place that's very close to where the developers work. Place them on a Friday afternoon. Make sure that there's beer in the observation room so people can entertain themselves and have a fun time, have a nice time. Uh, developers should learn more about basic usability, perhaps. But I prefer that Paul's remark, uh, okay. So let's take the scenario once again. These are the problems that I see, in, that I see with it. It's in a, the lab is in a separate building. Their user interfaces are lousy. It probably doesn't further the communication between Paul and his colleagues, and he basically thinks, deep in his head, that their interfaces are lousy. He should treat them with more respect. 50 pages, that's an unusable size for a usability test report. 50 minute video where they looked at Paul when he described all the problems. That is not the useful way of communicating your usability test results. So I perfectly understand that he did not, that he does not have much uh, success with his developers. So my advice to you is be humble and insist on having your skills and procedures checked regularly to keep sharp. Do that by certification. Do that by having a neutral person come in and evaluate your interviewing skills and your usability testing skills. Because these are some of the key things that we do. Case four, cooperating with or educating the hippo. Now, the first ones I've, I've shown, the first videos that I've shown have been with very unco uncooperative videos. Let me try to show you a slightly more positive one. I want a carousel on my own page. Okay. Why do you want that? Because it meets a business need. It will appease the internal stakeholders by telling them, yes, you can have your content at the top of the home page. Plus, it will stop the endless whining from all the departments that want their content at the top of the corporate internet's home page. Right, but it may not work well for our users. Perhaps not, but frankly speaking, I don't care. It will keep me out of arguments with the executive level because everybody will have some content at the top of the home page. We control the promotion of that content via a weekly summary email sent to all the staff with teasers that link to the same pages of that week's carousel content. Okay, I see. So it's a good solution to appease our internal stakeholders. What I'd recommend is adding alternate paths for our users' sake to the same content. Just because we know from experience that carousels don't really work very well, we can test these to make sure that they work. Sounds like a win-win situation. Yep. So, that's an example of a more constructive cooperation between the UXer and the boss. So, that's this one here, and that is the I'm sorry, the final one. I want a carousel on the home page. Okay, why do you want that? Because the developers are able to implement it fast. I already spoke to Peter, he says he can implement it in a few hours in the next sprint. Plus, if we don't like it, we can always change it later on. Okay, if we develop a solution that doesn't work and later need to change it or redesign it, then costs are probably going to start adding up. How will we know if it works or not? We can ask the marketing people and our experienced developers. They know what users want. I would recommend that we ask the users. We can run a simple usability test 
in 10 to 15 hours, then we're basing our decisions on real customer feedback rather than opinions. What's a usability test? And this is where it's very important that you have a good answer ready for your boss. So listen carefully to what um, Alice is saying again. A usability test is where we get three to five users and ask them to do representative tasks while we observe them. You're very welcome to observe the sessions. <coughs> Sounds interesting. Can you really do that in 15 hours? If so, make it happen. Just send me a note and let me know when and where the test will take place. Yes, and then I would almost add, hallelujah. Right, so this is a manuscript. If you get the slides afterwards, you will see how these arguments come in place. And by the way, a challenge for you. If you have additional good answers, then I'm certainly willing to add additional scenarios, scenario six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if you have other great questions to the question, uh, uh, to the challenge, I want the carousel on the home page. Let me know. Right, so my final point is beans and noses, and this is something that I learned from my friend and colleague, Jared School of Use Interface Engineering. Jared School says, no matter how much you try, you can't stop certain people from sticking beans up their noses. Now, I don't know what the Turkish expression is for that, but it's certainly not a good idea to stick beans up your noses. Right. And that's where Jared says, that's when I move on. So, and then he comes with a long explanation. Essentially, he says, in that case, I'm wasting my time. And perhaps there are other people who can make better use of my services. Now, I know this is a very tough decision to make. And what I have learned over many years, and as you can see, I have been in this business for longer than I really like to think of, it takes time, even when the captain is with him, it takes time to change the course of a super tanker. And many corporate organizations are essentially super tankers. You don't change their policies overnight. Which is actually where we come to my final, uh, the final vote of today. Um, let's say our organization is at maturity level one, incomplete. You are doing all you can to advance UX maturity. How long should you wait for something to happen? Please. Let's have a look. Ah, yeah. Have patience. Oops. <laughs> My experience is one to two years. I had a story of a lady who was a great UXer who waited for one month and, uh, I'm sorry, for one year and 11 months. And then she quit. And on the day when she left the company, on her final goodbye party, the company, uh, the top staff announced that they were doing some of the things that she really wanted to do. And she would have stayed if she had done them. Right, so have patience. So, the summary. Um, 
first a shameless self-promotion. I'm also responsible for UX certification by a European organization that has certified more than 4,000 UX professionals. So if you think that multiple choice questions, like the one that you have seen in this presentation, are helpful, go in, take a look at our stuff, maybe you will find it helpful. Right, so educating your hippos, if you have people who have opinions, conduct usability tests, that's the absolute number one. The one advice that I most of all want you to take away from this talk. Conduct discount usability tests, so-called guerrilla usability tests, they're cheap, Make it easy for stakeholders to observe usability tests, build and review user journey maps. That's a new tool we have, it wasn't long five years ago. They're very good, very strong to convince your stakeholders, especially if you let them take part in developing the user journey maps. Study, learn, and speak the language of your bosses. Support team, because they are essentially your users. You have two kinds of users, the end users and your organization users. Explain what you do. UX isn't rocket science. Demystify it. Explain people what it is that you do and why you do it. Report qualitative results, key performance indicators and return on investment to management. But do it in a useful way. So management understands what it is that you're saying. And then, even though it can be hard, accept that some of the that some products with non-perfect usability will actually get released. And that is my final slide. That's what I've been trying desperately to communicate to you over the past 40 minutes. Okay, thank you. Any questions?
That's up to you to decide. <laughs> I will be I will be around for the rest of the day. I can't promise that I'll be here tomorrow. So if there are any questions that you don't dare to ask again in the in the audience, please come up and say, 12, what was it that you actually meant with? Okay.